the conversations that I've had with uh, all of you, like, I mean, I've been in contact with most people in the audience at some point. Uh, I can't stress how much they've shaped uh, the way I've pursued this work uh, in terms of understanding how people view autonomous vehicles, what they want to see out of them, as well as what are some of the other surrounding technologies that we can have these conversations about. Um, and building off that whole idea, um, I have to introduce Jackie. <laughs> because uh, my conversations with her and uh, Phil Koopman, who is one of the foremost safety experts on autonomous vehicles, have been some of the most uh, formative uh, conversations for me in this regard for understanding safety standards and uh, how the sausage is made, really. <laughs> um, for, yeah, really good description going into that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, Jackie is like just a fountain of knowledge who has been tremendous uh, in understanding anything related to technology in Pittsburgh, not just autonomous vehicles. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand things off to her. Thank you, Chase. Um, that was a very kind introduction. Um, and uh, as, as Chase mentioned, um, you know, here we are, we're going to be talking, we've heard a lot about autonomous vehicles. Could I talk all day about autonomous vehicles? Yes, I could, and yes, I have, and yes, I do. But for today, we're going to be shifting around a little bit related to some of the emerging technologies that, you know, our, our friends here on the panel are working on. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to do intros first. I'm going to ask each one of them some individualized questions, and then we'll kind of open things up. So does that sound good? Um, Let's start with intros, and Michelle, go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Michelle Conklin. I am the executive director of Bots IQ. Uh, we are a little different, I think, than most everybody in this, in this room today, but our program's aimed at getting kids, K to 12, interested in careers in manufacturing and robotics. So we're a workforce development program. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more today about some of the programs we do, some of the initiatives, and some of the beliefs we have. But um, we're all about trying to get those emerging technologies introduced to kids so that we can have the workforce of tomorrow um, like we need it, so thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Alessandro. I'm an assistant professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Pitt. I direct the Discover Lab, which is a research space around revolving around digital, digital twin models for physical infrastructure. So we mostly uh, devote our uh, attention and research on um, bridges, pavements, and uh, physical infrastructure in, for transportation industry. So I'm very, very happy to be here. It's been fantastic conversation, and I look forward to some more. Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Trevor Stahl. I am a civic innovation specialist with the city of Pittsburgh, Department of Innovation and Performance, um, mostly IT. We'll get into that later. Find me later. Um, my main program, and I think reason for being here, is I help run our PGH Lab program, which helps connect local startups, specifically Pittsburgh based in the region, to city departments and authorities in order to run pilots for a period of six months. So excited to uh, be here and thank you for sticking with us post lunch. And I'm Jackie Erickson. I know Chase uh, gave a little bit of background. I spent years um, working on autonomous vehicle safety, also in the robotics community. Prior to that, uh, US Senate with Senator Bob Casey and just a big fan of uh, technology. I am currently the senior manager of legislative and regulatory trends for Magna. Um, Magna is a mobility technology company. We are the largest supplier in the automotive space in North America forth globally. Um, my role is to work with our subject matter experts internally um, on regulations and policies that are impacting our products. And our products are basically everything on a vehicle, everything on a vehicle, um, not the tires, not the windshield. So think electronics, powertrain, seats, interior, exterior. Um, our largest facility over in uh, Graz, Austria, is uh, contract manufacturing, which we actually do with a, a number of companies, um, design and full assembly. So my role is to know what's going on with our regulations in the automotive space in China, Europe, and North America. There's a lot there. <laughs> so um, you will hear me probably uh, tie in a few things in relation to what is going on in the automotive space as well. But... Let's talk Pittsburgh. Let's talk PGH Labs. This is what I want to know, Trevor. Okay, 
you have principles within your space, right? And so you have companies that are coming in. What are you looking for? What guides you when you're making a selection on a startup? So I've actually, I get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about PGH Lab is uh, myself and my actual shout out to colleague Ella in the uh, space here. We don't necessarily select companies ourselves. We facilitate the selection process. And the main thing that we look for is, is there someone somewhere in the city or authority that is able to raise their hand and say, this tech is interesting or needed, or I just want to learn more, and they're able to engage in our six-month pilot? So most companies will actually go through um, a two-round selection process. We have a review committee. That review committee is comprised of, ideally, all of the city departments as well as the authorities that can put eyes on every single application that comes through. So it's a bit of a lengthy process. Um, once the applications are reviewed, if an interest is peaked or say there's a question or whatever that, that spark of inspiration, if you will, exists, we progress them to a pitch competition. And then that pitch, every company will have five to 10-ish minutes, it varies, um, in order to tell us exactly what their idea is, what their service is, and it could be a, something as simple as, I want to learn and create a white paper on mobility. Um, those are recorded, and then we disseminate those out to all of our partners and constituents, again, looking for that volunteer. So does your outlook change at PGH Labs when there's a change of administration? So here we are now within a year of, a, of, the, of Mayor Ganey. Are they saying, hey, this is what we're interested in. Can you keep your eyes open for this type of technology? Do, they, do you have those conversations? We do. Um, our kind of goal is to, to touch departments where we can and, yeah. and kind of stay connected. Um, I think that the, the civic innovation role as a whole is very unique at the city, as in like, I don't have enough hands for all of the pots that, that I'm sticking my fingers in. Um, so we do try to keep like a pulse on like what's, what uh, uh, departments are interested in. From that mayoral perspective though, um, we do look to the mayor for guidance. What are you interested in? What is your administration looking to tackle? Things of that nature. So to, to kind of take a quick from then to now, um, Mayor Perduto was obviously very interested in the environment. We actually still have that as one of our core interest areas for the program. Um, that has been something that has carried over. But one of the additions we've had with Mayor Ganey has been the um, focus on equity and safety. Equity has always been a part of the program, but it is even more so highlighted now. And then the added benefit is that safety component. How can we make city uh, processes safer for our workers? How can we make city in general safer for our residents? So we do take those things into consideration during our selection process. And we do ask companies self-select into one of these fields, but we always have an open call. One of the magical things, I'll say, of the program is it's really a way for the ecosystem and industry to tell us what we don't know. Tell us your project, tell us what's in our own backyard, and hopefully we can find a connection for you so we can learn as government. Yeah. Now that's, that's great. So for folks that are interested, it sounds like there's a great connection here on some opportunities. Uh, and speaking of opportunities, we're gonna turn it over to Michelle because as we are building out our ecosystem, it is so, so important to be able to look at early education and programming to build up our knowledge base. Um, and, and so, Michelle, I, I, you know, I want to kind of take a, an approach here is, you know, I'm a mother of two boys. One is 11, one is 14. One has some really academic gifts. The other has his own gifts. What do you tell a parent like me that's you know, getting ready to, to put a kid through high school or preparing for this? What are the opportunities um, for your program specifically for younger kids and how they translate into either high school or beyond high school? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I like to also address um, before I speak specific about Bots IQ is there are amazing things happening in classrooms across our region. And um, 
one of the, the things that we try to do as a program indirectly is to help educators understand that something that they're already doing, the maker movement, for example, is a big thing that's come through um, grade schools, element, um, high schools uh, across the, the country for about 10 to 15 years now. And it's a great movement, getting kids making and being creative and exploring things in a, in a safe way, being um, problem solvers, creative thinkers. Those are skills that are going to help them in no matter what career. But what oftentimes we find is that educators aren't aware of the careers that are out there. And so a big part of the conversations that we have in, as an organization is to make them aware of manufacturing and robotics careers. Um, you know, Pittsburgh's known as the robotics capital of the world, um, whether we all know that or not, but I can tell you that parents don't. And so that's one of the conversations that we try to have a lot of the times is to help um, teachers who are the advocates for this understand that they are already doing some really great things in the classroom, helping them understand that those activities relate to the real world. And possibly whether it's through the, the educator themselves or the classrooms, getting those kids out to see it. Um, we hosted in Pittsburgh with the Pittsburgh Robotics Network, the Discovery Day last fall. There's going to be another one this November, really highlighting the opportunities that exist. That's an exciting um, time for us as a, as a community, but us as a city in, in this space, as, a, as the leaders, um, to really highlight and learn about the technologies. And I think, um, you know, going back to parents, it, it is um, a difficult thing. I, I have two boys as well, um, middle and high school as well. And it is a challenge as a parent to think what is out there for them and not being aware of it is really one of the first steps. So um, trying to help um, us as Pittsburghers understand that there is a lot of great technologies happening here. Manufacturing has transformed itself from our steel mills, which we um, can look back and see all the historical photos and things like that. But that is, that's what it is. What it is today is extremely technologically advanced, um, very clean, um, and really an in-demand field. And so helping parents understand that there are career opportunities here in our region for their, their children who are makers, who are creative problem solvers, who are loving that sort of pathway, that those classes, those activities. I mean, kids love to tinker with Legos and blocks and build things, helping them to understand that, that there's jobs out there that use those same, those same skills. Oh, I appreciate that, and, and you make a good point from a steel mills to this, this tech community, and it's so appropriate of where we are. I'm gonna kind of date myself, but when I was eight years old, I would come down you know, to this area every weekend from the South Hills, and every week I could see, maybe I was seven at the time, I don't remember, um, you could see these mills running. And then one weekend, they weren't. And I remember looking over at my dad going, why am I not seeing that white steam from the large building, this one over here, right? That is, you know, why, why aren't we seeing it? And he would say, thousands of people lost their job this week. We don't know what's going to happen. And this site sat for 20 some years, right? We just kind of watched this brownfield just be completely barren. Um, and at that point in time, people were leaving Pittsburgh. People, most of the people that I graduated, they left. There wasn't anything here for them. I can finally turn to my kids and go, wow, look, look at this. And, and I'm gonna quote you, Michelle, from our pre-call. This could be what? What is Pittsburgh, right? <laughs> I say Pittsburgh's the land of opportunity. I mean, when you think about robotics and manufacturing, we're just on the touch, the, the starting tip of it. And it really is um, that, that world out there for our kids and for our future. And we have to make them aware of it and make sure that they're prepared for it and that we're not closing doors and, and not allowing them access to the opportunities to explore it. So. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle, that was great. Um, so we're gonna switch over from, uh, over into the university setting. So, Alessandro, you have an interesting background, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna set the stage here. It's January 23rd, January 22nd? 23rd. 23rd, 2022. It's a cold day, really cold day. Everybody was, though, ready for this day, in, especially in Pittsburgh, even in the automotive space, anybody doing infrastructure, because on that day, who was coming to town? President Biden. President Joe Biden. Right? He was touting his infrastructure plan, and the universe had a plan for Joe. It was to come to Pittsburgh, not to talk about his plan, but to talk about the collapse of the Fern Hollow Bridge that happened a few hours before he was to touch down. I'm going to cue Alessandro, because his work comes up next. Go ahead. 
well, comes after a lot of other work, inc <laughs> incredible work that has been done. But so, as civil engineers, particularly structural engineers, which is my background, uh, the one of the recurring phrases is, well, you know, catastrophes are also an opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. And so we took this opportunity, and so we brought this, we pitched this idea to, um, you know, the National Science Foundation after a lot of discussions with the city and the Department of Transportation of basically obtaining information, obtaining um, LiDAR scans of the bridge as if it was being reconstructed. Obviously, there was no possibility of accessing the site during the NTSB investigation for obvious reasons, but when the site was released from NTSB, we started this, this endeavor, and so that was my, basically every weekend of my life for six months, because we couldn't be in the way of construction, obviously, so this, all of this was happening on a Saturday afternoon, generally. And so we we started working on this, and so we we one of the you know the equipment we were using is basically a large exocopter, so a UAV mounting a lidar sensor and uh, two cameras in the back, and so we were doing structural assessment of the bridge during construction, which is something that, curiously enough, had never been done before, and uh, we're still processing all this incredible amount of data, but that's been incredibly fun. So the work that you're doing, the technology that you have, are you thinking about other applications besides, you know, uh, bridges? You know, what other things are you looking at? Yes. The, 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 the reason why we started using this technology was actually for large-scale assessment of uh, river infrastructure for flood protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, you know, Pittsburgh is not particularly critical in that sense, but still there's something, uh, I think, uh, that, that could be done. One of the things that I'm very interested in currently, and we're trying to see where this could, could go, is to monitoring landslides. Mm -hmm. predicting and monitoring lens and quantifying really lens slides there's actually we've been in a lot of discussion with chase uh, and, and and the city and yeah there's clearly a lot of opportunities of you know large scale uh, assessment of uh, critical infrastructure is certainly something that is and pittsburgh's an old city we're not phoenix we're not correct. flat right correct. and, and even I, when i go to michigan everything's flat and wide roads that's why we're these ginormous cars right but you know, you, you mentioned you know locks and dams and, and rivers, and where's Stan? There's, I'm looking for first there he is, Stan. For the years that Stan and I were in the Senate, most of our our focus a lot was on the infrastructures related to the locks and dam system that was over uh, Elizabeth. I think they removed that finally was over like 130 years old. But uh, you know, we take a look at the applications that you're looking at, and so Trevor, you're 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 watching some of this stuff happen. How you know? How, how, when you see something like a crisis and you see a new um, technology come out of it, what, how are you thinking about it? I don't know if this is, if this is the happy answer, but honestly, <laughs> I'm thinking about it as an opportunity, right? Like, no one wants a crisis to occur. No one wants a bridge to fall or a building to collapse or a landslide. Water main to break, I could go on. Um, but anytime something like this does happen, it, I feel that there's always a, uh, a buzz, if you will, in the innovation space. There was or is now suddenly a solution to this issue and people are paying attention, right? So, so my mind a lot of the time goes to how can we capture this? We've talked a lot, I think, about um, the narrative, right? Like how can we capture this narrative, this attention that suddenly the public and ourselves now has to push forward a solution, to say, hey, there was just a landslide. Oh, suddenly there's a drone system or there's been a drone system that could help with this. So how do we begin to connect those dots and those pipelines to make some type of change happen? And I think as government, we're pulled in a lot of directions, um, but always we keep that focus on like the safety of the public. We are stewards of the public. So, so capitalizing, I'll say, on that, na on that attention, that narrative, I think is critical. It's unfortunate, but this is an opportunity for us to learn and ideally invest in our own local startups and ecosystem. Yeah, that's great. And I want to turn it over to Michelle because, you know, there's a crisis, emerging technologies, you know, there's some silver lining. But then there's always a workforce side of this. So, you know, fill, yeah, in, a, fill in the gaps I mean, here. Again, catastrophic events 
are awful, but it is a learning opportunity in the classroom as well. And having kids think through that process, understanding the why, but also creating the, the solution. So um, interestingly, we, we run a program with the ARM Institute here in, in um, Pittsburgh called Robo Recharge, aimed at getting kids to use robotic solutions to problems. And so that would be a perfect opportunity for us to pivot to um, a real world issue and, and help it um, be impactful for those those students and I think that's what really is that spark that memorable experience that helps kids understand oh like I could solve that problem in the future and and they want to they're they're innovative creative kids out there that this is just the pathway for them they just don't know how to get there so having those learning moments I think is, is a great way to do it so the programs that you work with um, which communities are you more focused on? Because let me just give you a hypothetical. <laughs> Touring high schools, I go to Central Catholic, love Central Catholic. They have a brand new STEM building, right? That's gonna be much different than other communities around the city of Pittsburgh. So how do you help those other communities? Yeah, I don't even think we talked about this, Jackie, so you just tossed me a nice soft yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Bots IQ, um, we, we typically partner with schools. We've been in the area almost 20 years, um, and we go into schools across the region, um, 15 counties, so not just Pittsburgh specific. But we are actually, um, I think construction should be finishing in about a week or so um, on our space in Suburban General, which is in Bellevue, um, just outside the city. But we are partnering with AHN Highmark to take over about 5,000 square foot of the Suburban General Hospital, which is a closed hospital. It's been closed about 10, 10 or so years, and it's really transforming itself into a community resource. We're hoping um, our, our offices will all be moving there and in that 5,000 square foot to be a maker space for students and families to come and learn about these technologies, for kids to gain the skills and knowledge needed for the careers out there and, and put them on a pathway. Um, so we will very soon have our own location. Um, and that, I keep telling my board, is the first of many. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I mentioned we cover a large area, but we, we had to start somewhere. And um, the city of Pittsburgh, um, Pittsburgh Public Schools, we've been working with them in a variety of different ways to get in there. But as you can imagine, there's, there's always a lot on a champion's plate. That's what we call an educator who um, partners with us. And um, so we want to try and find ways to um, provide access to everybody. Um, and this is our, our first of, of many. So it's exciting. Great. Congratulations. So Alessandra, from a, from a university perspective, can you go in and maybe demo some things and really like encourage these folks? What yes. do you, how, how do you kind of play into that? That's a fantastic, uh, yeah, fantastic cue. And yes, the, the, answer, the short answer is yes. Yeah. The long answer is we're always looking for opportunities to do this. Actually, this is, um, is very timely. Just two days ago, the, the National Science Foundation um, circulated a dear colleague letter, just a letter to colleagues saying that one of the biggest challenges for the country specifically is attracting and retaining STEM workforce. And so they're requesting ideas. And so how do we do this, right? So part of, you know, there's a big, in academia, there's a big component in um, K-12 engagement and outreach, obviously. What, um, I can tell you a little story of what we do. We recently developed, uh, back to the flood protection work, we recently developed, um, I don't know if anyone has ever seen one, but this is a pro original project from UC Davis where they built a augmented reality sandbox for simulation of flood and water. And it's literally a sandbox. It's a child sandbox. But as you play, th there's a cam, a projector that projects the isolines and computes water flow across the terrain. And so we're using this to teach flood protection awareness and basically uh, to mostly elementary and middle school, but it, it went, you know, it worked really well with pretty much uh, all of the students. And in certain neighborhoods, especially here, um, I'm in the Bridgeville area, so we know about floods, right? There you go. Carnegie, we know about <laughs> floods, right? So it's important to, to know what's, what's out there and, and how to prepare, that's for sure. Um, great. Okay, so we all are in a little bit of different spaces in this technology. You know, we've heard, a lot, again, a lot about AVs, and we can talk about AVs, um, but I really want to know whether on a personal level or even from your organizational perspective, what is the most exciting technology that you think is coming out? Uh, I wouldn't just say maybe in Pittsburgh or just something that gets you, like, this is going to be a game changer. Trevor, you're seeing lots of stuff, so. <laughs> uh, so, so I have to pick one. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
So I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things. Um, so, so something that I'm personally very excited about um, is, is kind of a two-parter. Um, we're in our eighth cohort of PGH Lab. The program has been through many iterations and cycles, and I personally have been with them f from five, five, six, seven, and now eight. Um, I'll give one from the seventh that I think is a real success story um, and perhaps touches on that indu uh, industry as government, and then one that I'm personally really excited about and keeping my fingers crossed. Um, so from, from government and industry, we recently partnered with a company called Clupify, um, local Pittsburgh-based, uh, daughter, father, uh, immigrant combo, fantastic story, but their services help track tier three emissions for government entities, corporate entities too, but starting in government. Um, for those of you that don't know, those tier three emissions tend to be super, super granular. As you talk about emissions, you can kind of think of um, as you increase in, in level, tier three being the highest, they are the hardest to track. So the service that they're providing us as the city of Pittsburgh, and we're actually successful in getting a contract for, um, helps us track our entire procurement as a city and track to a company the level of emissions that they're having. So as a quick scenario, say I have two paper producers. Paper producer one has 100 uh, tons of carbon produced per stack of paper. Carbon producer, or paper producer two has 200 pounds of carbon produced per uh, stack of paper. I then as a government entity can say, whatever your carbon emission is, that's my emission. I'm consuming your product. So it puts us in a very unique situation where we can say, you know, you're only producing 100 tons and you're producing 200 tons. You producing 200 tons, you actually have the service specific whatever we need. But now, since we know that there's an alternative, we want to work with you to lower your carbon emissions. Or perhaps you don't want to work with us so we can transition away. It just puts us in a position of knowledge so we can adhere better to, um, for instance, our like 2030 um, environmental sustainability goals. No, that is so important. I'm glad that you bring, what was the name of the company again? Clupify. Because every publicly traded company in, you know, across the United States, so for those that are in you know, publicly traded companies in Pittsburgh, is that through the SEC, you need to be able to track your emissions. Like You have to be mm -hmm. able to publicly report this stuff starting here. I think they'll do final rule at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is super exciting. Glad we're hearing things out of Pittsburgh. I've seen things in the West Coast, but I haven't heard things out of Pittsburgh. So that's really awesome. Thanks. It's been cool. If yeah. I can stick with one more second. Yeah, yeah, go for so it. So a for personal it. favorite of mine <laughs> is this company called Ecotone. They focus specifically, yeah, on reducing food waste. And they have this like beautiful system. It's a shipping container. You put your food waste into it. It processes it into this wonderful like uh, compost. Fertilizer as well comes out of it. So not only are they reducing the amount of food waste going into landfill, they're also producing fertilizer, which we're discovering is a huge need. So you're reducing what you're putting into the land in terms of garbage and revitalizing it, so. So can you communicate this to like other communities outside and be like, hey, we got this. Can you call up again um, the borough of Bridgeville and say, you should like share this with your, can you start that network so we all know how to make these process improvements? So that's that's something that we're trying to tackle now. So I'm open to, uh, to additional <laughs> ideas if anyone has that. Um, we do try to leverage our platform um, and something uh, my colleague Ella and I championed from the last cohort is these bite-sized PGH Lab videos. You can go on YouTube, uh, PGH Lab 7.0, um, Clupify's on there. And um, there are these very quick, like one to two minute videos overviewing everything that we accomplished in the cycle. So the goal here is um, every cohort, we're going to be producing these videos to help spread the word. And I am happy to say, um, Clupify's actually gotten connected from a couple other cities. Um, I don't know for sure if it's a result of the videos, but I'll, I'll, take yeah, I'll take some credit there. <laughs> so, so yeah, we are trying to spread the word. The goal is to keep local talent, and I have to say I love that all of us kind of hit that value chain of local talent here in Pittsburgh. Um, the goal is to keep our innovative minds, our engaged minds here, um, attract new folks here. Um, but of course, we, we want our companies to succeed. So stay yeah. here, but yeah, connect with Cincinnati, connect with Seattle, yeah, yeah, yeah. go to, I don't know, Vancouver. Like, we, we want that success to grow. That's awesome. All right, Alessandra, what is your favorite upcoming emerging technology besides the one you're working on, I should say? <laughs> she changes the question. Oh. <laughs> um, 
No, I, I moved the goalpost. Yeah, Sorry no, about that. I mean, from yeah, research perspective, we all have our, our own interests. My personal, uh, my personal favorite um, is the convergence of augmented and extended reality technology, which is becoming finally becoming available. It has been a long time in the making, and I think it's going to help significantly in a lot of very safety-related tasks. Okay, so these immersive, these sort of, I think we've been for almost two decades in this promise of virtual reality being where you know, we would spend our days, which it's clearly not happening. Uh, and large companies, Meta, is sinking a lot of money into that. But I think the, the technology is finally getting to a point where you can effectively, you can be effective in training people to very hazardous, sort of prone related jobs, and which is and cons the construction industry is clearly one of the yeah. top ones, oh, and the one that I'm thinking of specifically, but it really, really, it's really going to be a game-changing aspect, technically. Yeah. We've seen a lot of companies, you know, um, do remote tech, remote work, right, for, for construction and, and mining, and, and it's really catching on, um, especially for those areas that are from a safety perspective, right? Um, so, yeah, that's that's definitely something to watch. So, Michelle, what's your, what's your favorite? What do you... What are you excited about? So much. So <laughs> just to plug Ecotone. Um, so we actually um, got introduced to Dylan um, about a year ago. And two of our alumni just applied for his internship. So we were just exchanging emails this week. So um, great company. And they're moving. Also, they're going to have a container at Suburban General because we have community kitchen there. And so it'll be a great um, uh, place to create some awesome uh, compost, but then put into our greenhouse on, on campus too. So it's, it's like all full circle. I love it. And it's all Pittsburgh, which again, love. Um, so kind of on the vein of construction, I mean, I see a lot of really cool technologies out there. Um, but last week I had the privilege of touring Advanced Construction Robotics, which is um, just up Route 8 in Gibsonia just outside the city, and um, they have two really amazing, cool technology um, solutions, which the one robotic um, solution is it ties rebar, and the other is um, their newer robot, and it lays the rebar. And so if you think about safety, construction, things like that, I mean, that job was manually done, and it's still manually done across much of the country, but it's a, an unsafe job. It's also a job that if you're working an eight to 10 hour day, you're bent over the entire day. It's not a good quality job. So this is a, a solution out there, not only to make it more safe for um, folks, but it's also um, you know, solving the issue that we need bridges repaired, built, whatever, in a faster amount of time. So um, one of the coolest things that I've, I've seen recently, and I thought, wow, that who thought of that? Like it was, it seems so simple, but that's what a lot of robotics is all about: is taking a problem and creating a, a simple solution. Um, and so, and yeah. top of mind, definitely one of my favorite right now. That's great. I mean, robotics is is really great for those simple one, two, three tasks. You know, I, I walk into some of our facilities doing you know automotive work, and you, you've seen the videos, right? But it is so impressive that they can do it very precise. Um, but it also allows, um, you know, our employees to do the more fine tuning, the things that need to be, you know, addressed uh, and, and making sure quality is there uh, as well. And, you know, you talk about construction, we talk about augmented reality, we, we see what's happening in the environmental space, especially, um, I'll, I'll use a quote from an old colleague of mine from Carnegie Robotics, Chris Osterwood, is that things like robotics, it's not an industry in itself, it's a solution to every industry. And I think this is where Pittsburgh really can play a very, you know, a global centerpiece, right? You know, whether, um, you know, we're here in Roboburg and we have the people to be able to really advance things in, in different spaces. But I, I know we're, we're kind of coming close to time, but the one thing that, you know, we've, we've heard the word safety, right? This is a priority for you um, from a Pittsburgh standpoint. Um, Alessandro, your whole purpose is to be able to help create infrastructures, you know, be, be safe. You know, the jobs that you're working towards are intended to keep people from harm and put them in places where they have a higher quality and, and safer and, and better quality of life. But if there's something related to safety that you want to address, and look, again, I'm an AV safety person, so I could just talk all day. Is there a particular policy that you think in your world or your world or your world that can help either um, you know, extend whether the other things are safer or, or something that you're just mindful of, like when we talk safety? Because everybody's got their own definition of safe. So maybe I should rephrase that. What is your definition of safe? <laughs> Go ahead. 
maybe I can start this. Um, the way I like to think about safety is yeah. that it's encompassed in sustainability. That's my opinion. Because if you work safe, everything you do, it's going to be, you know, the industry, the industry at large is going to be more sustainable, right? And um, one of the things, uh, one of the things we're trying to look um, into, specifically with the, with PennDOT currently, is how we train, especially young workers. So if you look at statistics, young workers are, by large, the the last the largest percentage of accidents on construction sites. And the reason is that obviously you're less experienced. It's it's a pretty obvious type of solution, but we have the data to back it up. And so. Some people argue that it's uh, smaller attention spans, or there, there might be many reasons. But um, one of the one of the points that seems to be recurring is that training needs to be different. And so, how do we take this incredible technology that's been developed daily in the neighborhoods of the city and take it to make an actionable difference in how we train for safety, right? And this is one of the things we're looking at, for example. But there's a million examples. This is my personal sort of angle. I, I guess I'm next. Um, I, so I, I just have my grandpa in the back of my mind going, measure twice, cut once. Um, but I think safety to me is, is, is to stick with that measuring twice cut once is, is, is to really evaluate the way that we do work now, right? Like we're talking about robotics, we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about education and drones and all of these different um, industries and aspects that, that Pittsburgh I think is, is capturing and ripe to even to, to continue to, to really invest in. Um, so for me, when I think of safety, I just kind of think of evaluating the work that we have now um, and, and identifying perhaps those, those areas of highest risk and how can we make that safer for that person? Not necessarily get rid of their job or replace them, but how can we make sure that we are positioning them with the tools and the training to, to do their job to the greatest capability in the safest way possible? Um, uh, with, with the public works right now, um, one of our cohorts, or one of our companies in our eighth cohort right now, um, Element Exo, we're, we're piloting at the city for the first time ever exoskeletons. Um, and it's, it doesn't always have to be a high tech solution. Like this is, you, you step into it, it's kind of got like a back brace. One of our workers called it a popsicle. Um, but, but it relieves the strain off of the back. Um, so that's a, that's a small implementation that we can have that could be completely life-changing for someone. You very rarely bounce back full from a back injury. So, so that's kind of what I think of safety is like, how can we provide the tools or the trainings or, or whatever that is to the work being done to, to empower people to feel safe or speak up if they don't feel safe? Yeah, no, those are all good points. We'll give it to Michelle. Yeah, I mean, um, safety is something obviously important in manufacturing and robotics, um, and, and we have a registered uh, robotics technician pre-apprenticeship, and it's a big chunk of, it's one of the six core competencies that we focus on, um, and so it is something that we really uh, make sure that our students have access to this, the skills and knowledge out there to, to get it, because, you know, to your point, uh, kids these days, I mean, um, I can't tell you how many children aren't getting basic hand tools and things like that um, in, included in their education as they come through K to 12. Um, they're graduating high school, never even touching a screwdriver, let alone a power tool or anything like that. And those are life skills. So, you know, trying to provide them with those opportunities to not only know how to use those tools and when to apply them, but to safely apply them. Um, because we, not only do we need that in the skills of, of our careers, but they need that to, to be successful in life. And so um, trying to find ways to work with our education system. Um, Department of Ed in, in Pennsylvania just recently um, revised their science and technology standards. Um, and incorporated 25% um, uh, of technology education into the, the science and engineering and technology, which is the largest to date. Um, it is a standardized test, so it also is going to put onus now on the school districts to make sure that their students have access um, to learning technology education, which is those classes that are going to incorporate um, hand tools and power tools and things like that too, as well as the design and engineering process. So um, that, that to me is, is a great 
policy win right now. Um, uh, it goes into effect in 2025, so we still have some time to help our, our educators really get on board and understand and, and be equipped to, to lead that. But um, it's, a, it's a right movement um, for our, our education system, which is, is good, always good to see. You give me hope for my kids. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm going to look to Chase for just timing, and do we open it up for questions, or can they close out? What, what, what's a... All right, we'll, uh, by all means, um, let's open it up for questions. Stan. Give Stan the mic. Uh, thank you. The, um, you know, here in Pittsburgh, we also have a long history of organized labor and uh, engaging with them. And, you know, we've, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, we've engaged with national AFL-CIO in their technology institute and they're eager to be able to figure out okay how do we take this technology and incorporate it into the trainings and programs of organized labor have uh, do you uh, do you guys have any experiences working with labor here in pittsburgh and engaging with them unions the only one i have is with cawp so the construction Con contractors association of western pennsylvania and my personal experience is that it's been a fantastic uh, type of relationship because they're really open, as you say, to a lot of these things. And they're the, the one thing that obviously from an academic st standpoint, really finding the good problem is really the, the gold mine, I think, for us. And that's been a very good relationship, I think, uh, hopefully for both of us, but certainly for me, for both parties, I mean. And where, you know, there's a lot of, you know, smaller issues that they experience that they've been very, very clear and adamant in bringing up and trying to find a solution for. So that's been uh, my personal experience. Now that's a, that's a good point, Stan. I want to ask, Michelle, do you ever communicate, like coordinate with apprenticeships that like kind of feed into it? Yeah, so um, some union, um, so the welders, we, we definitely have a lot of uh, individuals who go on to, to the iron workers and, and things like that, but um, apprenticeship is a big part. So one of the things that we also do with Bots IQ is, is talk about what we call non-traditional career pathways. Um, so everybody's familiar of Pitt, CMU, the, the, the big names in our, our region, um, but we do also try to highlight some of those that not many people know about. So apprenticeship would be definitely one area. Um, we're a program of the Pittsburgh chapter NTMA, um, which has its own apprenticeship program for uh, machinists, but we also, um, promote community colleges and uh, different pathways to success um, just to make sure that students have an opportunity to understand that there is a future for them um, and we can help them get there and there's a lot of different ways to, to make it. So um, we definitely do that. Thank you, this question is for Trevor. Um, it sounds like you're doing incubation do you have a mentorship program for the folks that you're bringing through the incubation process? Because it seems to me in a lot of those uh, environments, they really can benefit from the elders, statesmen in the community, right? So this is something that we're, we're really and earnestly looking at now. Um, a, a little bit more of the program history of PGH Lab. We have been through Four iter in, in eight cycles, we've been through four iterations of the um, management team. And shout out to um, our predecessor, um, Anya Alderman, uh, who I believe is still at Ascender. Um, stuck with it for 2016 to right to 2020. Um, so, so mentorship is something that we're looking at. And, and specifically within that, like, how do we take uh, our successful alumni, I mentioned Clupify, for instance, um, how do we say to our current cohorts that might just be starting out or might just getting into funding or whatever that situation is, you're now part of a network, right? Like we as PGH Lab, we've worked with, at the conclusion of this cohort, 47 different companies. Um, Unfortunately, not all of them are still around, but the ones that are, like, how do we say they've done it, they're doing it, Armin is here and have sat on the panel earlier, PGH Lab alumni, how do we capture what they're doing and they have done and transfer that to the current cohort? So in an effort for that, um, the first time this year, actually, we hosted an alumni panel, um, Armin also sat on that, um, but, uh, 
we hosted an alumni panel to try to get at the core of that. So, so let's bring in the folks, let's put them in front of um, our current cohort and actually some, some Venture for America um, students, Pittsburgh chapter. Um, we partnered with their director, uh, Megan Butler, to, to kind of co-host this event. Um, all of these folks that are interested in the startup space are doing something in the startup space. Here are some startup companies that one could even argue are, are kind of nudging out of the what I would define as a startup technically, um, space and are having the success, let's facilitate a conversation with them so, so they can really capture and learn like what worked, what didn't work. Um, a queen, uh, Watkin Wise from Royally Fit, uh, another local uh, PGH lab um, uh, uh, alumnus said something that really struck me. Like, you don't know what you don't know and she sat there and told everyone in the room, hey, if you don't have an insurance, hit me up right after this. I can give you a list of folks that you can talk to to get your insurance. If you don't have a lawyer, hit me up after. I can give you a list of folks that you can get a lawyer at. So that way we can make sure that you're getting paid for your time. There's just little learnings that I think um, startups, and really everyone, um, you don't know until you know. Um, speaking for myself, my mind's been blown from all of these panels. Uh, I was like, I got this, and maybe not. But um, yeah, just trying to like connect those dots. So, so to your point, yes, we are trying to, to deepen those connections and, and foster that community, um, but there's always more work to do. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Jim. Right? Yeah. So um, it, it is a little bit weird because I know that I have more sons than all of you together, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I, I appreciate what it is that you're, you're doing. Um, but it kind of goes back towards Trevor again. Because uh, I would say Nothing against PGH Lab. This is very important for me to say. As a two-time reject <laughs> that's currently working uh, for the Pittsburgh Parking Authority, no easier way to put David Honorado to sleep than to talk about APIs. Completely my fault. But what it turns into is if you, we are building tech people to go into things like the parking industry, which is not known for technology, what's the best way for us to teach people how to be smart and to also speak English so that people are willing to buy our stuff? It's a, it's a tech. So let me, let me ask a, just a, this follow-up question to the question. Are you basically saying like we have like tech people, but how do you get them involved in things that may be like parking or construction? Is that where you're kind of going with that I, one? I mean, well... <laughs> It, it's, it's more along the lines of, you could be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't sell your stuff, That's it doesn't right. go anywhere, right? right. So, yep. I mean, big fan, big fan of Clubify. It was really bizarre because I, I actually mentored Daniela. So it was really kind of funny because I was like, so it does work, right? So it, it's, I, I want to see more of our people finding that success, and I feel like it's the language barrier. Even though everybody's speaking English, mm -hmm. We're speaking two different types of English. So I'll add this, and then I want to hand it off, because I think you might ha have a much deeper understanding of this particular issue. But I'll, I'll say for, for PGH Lab that communication issue is critical um, at every level. Um, something we've started to do this year, well, last year, and we're continually evolving. We're a lab. Um, this year is uh, coaching and not me or a lot of coaching, like tagging people in the innovation ecosystem and bringing them in, providing them pl that platform from founders, from um, investors, from whoever, um, and having them coach our companies on this is how you give an elevator pitch. This is how you give that quick, I've captured your attention for 0.5 seconds. Let me use that word that's gonna be like, wait, what did you say? Let me ask and follow up. Um, so that's, to the language piece, what, what I would say we're, we're trying to um, 
build upon. There is an educational component there, but I, I'm going to turn it over to perhaps <laughs> to hear like, because it, right, like it starts, it starts so much younger. Like the, the education component of, the, of children, I guess I'll say, like that, that builds up, right? So I would say I'm getting a later half of that. But funny enough, like it, the answer isn't much different. Um, so the mentorship that was spoken about earlier is so important. The uh, the exposure to it. Um, so when we have a group, for example, in Robo Recharge um, that's interested in creating a robotic solution, I mean, sure, you can do internet research, but we put them with the industry professionals. So we want the kids to understand that there are careers out there in that space. You're solving a solution, uh, a, excuse me, you're solving a problem for them. You're creating this solution. Um, but we want to make sure that they're, they, they understand it to, to the T. Um, we also, we run a, a post-secondary internship program with our, our youth as well as they come through and um, we want them out in industry so we want to keep them here keep them at local companies building their networks but we we do the elevator pitch we do all of that the the sort of public speaking I mean that's a lost art in this this space um, and and it has been for quite some time but really um, over the last few years with technology really creeping in at younger ages I mean kids in elementary school having cell phones texting incoherent things but um, you know that's their that's their mode of communication so schools have gone from a loud noisy cafeteria to almost silent because kids are all on their technology devices and nobody's talking and that's that's a concern so um, you know we we try to make sure that everything is evolved around teamwork collaboration communication because um, it doesn't matter if you're going into manufacturing robotics you need that skill so um, I do think that the the verbiage that is introduced to kids has to be relevant, um, but at the same time, just the, the art of communication, I think, is, is really a lost one these days. And I'll add on from a communication standpoint, it's knowing your audience, right? You might have a great technology, but you know, f you know, hypothetically, if you're coming to a company like mine, we need to understand, is it alignment with your road, if our roadmap, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're building an app for parking, right, or whatever it might be from a, from a parking standpoint, you're going to hit up every single parking conference to be with like-minded people, to really understand what that is. You're going to have to get out of Pittsburgh and probably go to a few other places, right? Or, um, you know, if you have a technology related to sea diving, probably Pittsburgh's not the greatest place for that. Maybe rivers, yes. But you really need to get yourself into the environment with like-minded people to make those connections. And if you are an early stage startup, investors that guide you, right? And having really good investors that can give you some points. And for anybody who's been in a startup of like, what are the things you don't do? And what are the things you need to go after, right? And finding the right people to, to work alongside is, is going to be key to be that mentorship. So. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if it's a question, a rant, comment, whatever. Um, so, Jackie, you brought up your childhood here. Um, I looked you up. We graduated and went to college roughly at the same time. My father moved here in the 60s to work on a thing called a computer. He was among 300 people that year who were brought in, 500 the following year, so on and so forth. Today, that would be front page, top of the fold of the paper. Back then, no one paid attention. Um, so my experience of the 70s and 80s and 90s was of people moving away because their companies were transferring them out of here because the collapse of industry gave them an excuse to get the white collar people out of here, the knowledge base. But this region is not just about the mills. This region was a leader in aerospace. This leader was a region, uh, leader in transportation automation. This place was a leader in metallurgy. I can't tell you whenever I was getting my engineering degree how many um, things from U.S. Steel Labs were in the books about um, metal, right? Um, mechanical refrigeration, building automation, just going down the list. The reason I'm saying this is because we've gone from being embarrassed about our blue collar past and present, which we should not be, certainly, to completely, it seems, putting away our technology heritage in this discussion about what this region is 
to ourselves and to the rest of the world, which I think actually sells us short to ourselves and the rest of the world because you can't have one without the other and be what this city was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so my question and challenge to you both is how do you work that narrative into how we sell our place to ourselves especially, but also to the rest of the world because the reality is what we are saying about the mills, which is not insignificant in any ways, and I'm not trying to reduce that because my mother's family is from the mills, um, also needs to have place for this other side that is equally as significant in terms of its impact on the planet. There's a lot to say there. Um, you know, I, I can say that, again, from a heritage standpoint, we, we are embracing that. You know, I've, I've been all over the country, and when I say Pittsburgh, you get a mixed, kind of this mixed response, right? Um, but they, there has been this, like, oh, Pittsburgh more recently, right? Now, I'm in the automotive sector, and, and I should say most of the world is still Detroit. Everything is driven out of re Detroit. Um, but I know wherever I am, whether I'm in San Francisco, whether I'm in D.C., Detroit, I, you name it, right, Geneva, Switzerland, wherever I am, it's wearing that Pittsburgh pride and always touting, you know, the city and what we're capable of so that the story continues to trickle out. You know, this is a place for innovation. And that was hundreds of years ago, right? C Carnegie came here to innovate, to build a business, and he did it. Henry Frick, you know, the Alco the Mellons. We have a tradition of successful business people. And there's been a gap, there's no doubt. Uh, but I think that it's continuing, like everybody plays a role in cheering on our city. You wave that terrible towel as hard as you can, whether you're in Detroit and say, we're technology, we're education, we're finance. We are a place that we can live. Affordability doesn't have the same ring anymore because there are places, I hate to say it, that are more affordable than Pittsburgh. Um, but it's community, it's family, and there's opportunity land of opportunity. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that's a, that's a really uh, important message that we try to convey to our students. We actually, in our high school program, gather um, feedback from our students pre and post. So I, I, I don't remember, this is actually my second panel discussion today, so I don't know who I said this to, but um, every, every school that we partner with, every high school, we're taking kids out on tours. So the part of it is, is we want to introduce the skills in the classroom, but we take the students out to a local manufacturer in their community um, to see how those skills are put to work. Um, and we're very strategic on who we, we partner with because the stories do need to be told. Um, you know, we, we have Astrobotic here in, in Pittsburgh about to make national headlines um, with their, their um, robotic solution to go to, to the moon. It's amazing. But we don't hear about uh, the small to medium-sized manufacturers who make components for that here. And so we try to tell that story on the back end as well to be, to be the... Um, the storytellers of, of the great news. So um, we have over 80 members in our, our Pittsburgh chapter, but we work with over 200 companies here to tell that story, to make sure that kids know. We gather that pre and post, and we see that just that two-hour tour of a company is changing students' perspectives. They're understanding that manufacturing is safe. It is clear. It is clean. It is high tech. They are um, STEM careers. They can see a future in those companies. Um, so that those are the things that we're trying constantly to find ways to innovate. Um, we also, uh, for those of you who don't know, October is Manufacturing Month, National Manufacturing Month. We like to say we celebrate manufacturing all year round. But um, we really um, target that with our, our schools as well, um, whether we can get them out on tours or we can provide them with resources to understand, again, that, that manufacturing, not only, it, it built our city, it built our region, it hasn't gone away, um, even with uh, some small, some, some big hiccups in the past, um, some small changes to the technology, but it's, it's all here, um, and it's only continuing to grow um, with the, the technology of the robotics companies as well, um, and, and a big part is trying to connect those two so that they understand we can make it here as well as uh, um, anywhere across our region, so... Uh, 
Um, that seems like a perfect place to cut things off. I mean, I can't think of a better ending that kind of succinctly ties up everything uh, that we discussed today. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank our panel for um, doing a great way of sort of delivering on what we were hoping to accomplish today. I mean, all our panels have been amazing, but I feel like this ending that we just had, come on, I couldn't have asked for something better. <laughs> yeah.